very much and welcome to this tent and welcome to this... Welcome to Boris, isn't it brilliant to be back? It's so brilliant to be back. Roisin and I had our meet cute. We fell in love here four years ago, so it's nice to be re reunited here. It, it is, it's lovely. And we were out, not too late last night. I know, although I can't see any of you because I lost my glasses at some point amongst all the whiskey last night <laughs> and they haven't been retrieved. But Roisin tells me that you look like a lovely bunch. Yeah. <laughs> you look lovely. So I'm going to do my little intro and I'll tell you about the... Uh, little bit of Dear Dolly action we're going to do. So lots of you will know all of this already, but for anyone who doesn't, um, Dolly Alderton has been described as the voice of a generation and a Dorothy Parker for the social media age. She's one of Britain's most well-known newspaper columnists, having landed a dating column with the Sunday Times in her 20s. She's a best-selling author of the wildly successful 2018 memoir, Everything I Know About Love, which has sold half a million copies in the UK, which is incredible. Uh, also of her fantastic novel, Ghosts. And of course, she presented the High Low podcast with Pandora Sykes, which soundtracked the lives of thousands of women and led to a shed load of live events at which you absolutely excel and um, lately you can find her back in the Sunday Times because she's got this brilliant column called Dear Dolly where she gives amazing advice to people and so I thought wouldn't it be a great idea if Dolly was able to dispense some of that advice today <laughs> and I have a trusty assistant Anna here who has a we're calling a, a bag of Dolly basically <laughs> and we, Anna's going to go around and if anyone has a conundrum whether it's about life relationships any Thing. You can write it down briefly, we'll put it in the bag and anonymously, and later on, towards the end, we're going to come to... Uh, oh, God, it's starting already. I wasn't oh, sure great. how it would go down. So she can do any, she can basically solve anybody's problems. Isn't Anyone's right? problems. I know everything. I'm right about everything. <laughs> and if you look at my life and all the decisions I make, then you can see that I'm the person to trust. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. So just lift your hand up and Anna will come around. But we have to start with a massive week for you, Dolly, because your amazing television series, Everything I Know About Love, I came out this week, I watched it, and I, I know lots of people here, has anyone seen it yet? Absolutely brilliant. So I'd love to ask you about taking it from what was very factual, it's all about your life and times and amazing adventures, and turning that into something quite different in a way while yes. retaining the, the root of it. So what was that process like? It was really freeing because when you write a memoir, and as you know as a columnist, when you write from your personal life... Um, it, it often can feel kind of one note. You're restrained by what has happened in the reality of your life. And as we all know, like life can be pretty plotless. It can lack any sort of meaning. <laughs> it can lack symbolism. It can lack lessons. Um, and actually, what was amazing about taking the memoir over to the screen is that it gave me an opportunity to fictionalise it. Um, and, yeah, kind of reorder stuff. Like, that feeling of, I wish I had said that when that man said that awful thing to me that I was dating. Or, I wish I'd said that in that job interview. Or, I wish I hadn't worn that. That you get this place of, like, reordering life. And, uh, and the, I mean, it's still pretty, like, jam-packed with all the terrible decisions <laughs> I made in my 20s. But you get to kind of... Um, structure it in a way that's more satisfying so that is just like I just recommend anyone to do that to be honest <laughs> as a therapeutic <laughs> exercise on their past yeah um, I think there's Elizabeth, Elizabeth Gilbert quote I'm not sure if she said it to you in an interview where she talks about how in uh, fiction you can hide in plain sight because we'll talk later about how you've murdered the memoirist in you yes. and um, you now you can insert stuff into a fictionalized version that you can't you don't want to necessarily put in the real life version so did you manage yeah. to do a bit of that Loads. There was there was loads that I wanted to put in the book, but quite frankly, I couldn't because I've got like a 77-year-old cricketing father who wears a blazer and a tie. And I didn't want to scandalise my parents and their friends, and I didn't want to get in legal hot water with my ex-boyfriends. So um, there were lots of things that I felt like it was just too intimate or it was too personal. Whereas when you're in this space of semi-fiction, not only can you add this layer of the fantastical and the make-believe um, and the imagined to make it more expansive and diverse, you can also just like shoehorn in all the other stuff and you just you're not so vulnerable because like something that I found difficult about the memoir coming out and no one warned me about this I now think if anyone here particularly a woman wants to write a memoir it should like the whole experience should come with therapy built <laughs> into it because something that I hadn't realized is when you write a memoir the, the the criticism and the analysis and even the celebration that you get is not of your work, it's of you. Right. It's in, it, and, and that's quite tough to, you know, 
process to basically like read. So the, the book is about me and my best friend Farley, who I've always sort of wished is a much better human than me and I've always sort of wished I was more like her and then I went to got to a point where I was reading all these reviews saying I just preferred Farley I wish the whole book had been about Farley and I was just like well so do I actually (laughs) so um so it's nice now like when I wrote my novel I remember reading a review where someone had given criticism about the way it was written and I was like This is a great day. I can totally deal with people having criticism about the way I write. It's such a, like, cool, refreshing shower, having had years and years of, you know, of kind of people analysing who I am. So there's a bit of that again with the memoir, but it's much more like the focus is much more on the world I'm building rather than who I am as a person, and that is much better. Okay. And <laughs> when I'm thinking, because you wrote uh, Everything I Know About Love in your 20s, and yes. you're in what age now? 33. So a different kind of phase of your life. And when you look back, I mean, I'm sure you don't sit reading Everything I Know About Love. Maybe you do. Every night. <laughs> Every night. But when you think of that young woman who wrote it, how different are you? Is there things you notice now about, about yourself then that have changed? Yeah, for sure. I mean you must have the your columns that you've been doing for 20 years are they all online uh yeah pretty much do you ever go back and read 20 years ago uh god no <laughs> <laughs> that would be horrible but no i don't but i can yeah i there's things i tell that person like jesus come on what are you doing yeah the thing that i find is so interesting is like the certainty of youth I'm talking about, it was obviously five years ago, so I'm not talking about (laughs) my youth, my long ago youth. Um, But I do feel with every year I get older, the more comfortable I am sitting in the total randomness of life Mm. and how you just often can't join dots and you don't understand why things happen. You don't understand why people cheat or people don't love you who you love or you don't love the person you're supposed to love or friends melt away or parents drop down dead at a young age like all these things as you get older I think you just kind of realize like I'm so much more I'm so much more willing to have a space in my life of like not knowing of just being like well I'm just I guess I'll know on the deathbed what all of that was about (laughs) and until then I'm happy to just kind of process it day by day whereas I think in my 20s a lot of my writing was about like having a manifesto like living every day and at the end of it having some sort of like package of lessons that I can deliver to myself Mm. and my incredibly bored friends at the table (laughs) at the pub and indeed like you know readers and I'm much less interested now in like lessening about what relationships are all about and speaking of your friends because I suppose the love that's in your books and it's the thing that's very central to everything you do is friendship yeah and female friendship particularly and it's it that you know everything I know about love essentially was that it was a, a love between friends I'm, I'm just would love to know about all your friends and how they um have reacted to the tv series yeah. and the memoir and they obviously give you carte blanche to use everything Everything. There was one thing in the TV series that Farley said, oh, I'm not sure about that, Uh, which I'm not actually going to say what it is, but it was incredibly (laughs) embarrassing. Um, And then I just persuaded her, (laughs) Rashid. And you'll see it in episode three. Um, (laughs) But no, they're just like tickled pink. I'm so lucky because they're like my partner in life, those girls. They have been the most, my female friends have been the most consistent love of my life. They've been my domestic life. You know, they've been my the people I take to big work moments. They've been the people I introduce to my family. So I, my fascination is about relationships that form us. That's what I'm kind of writing about in, in every piece, everything that I do. So if they were funny about me writing about our story, then I would be sort of screwed. Yeah. But they not only do they love it, like, they revel in it. I mean, Farley now is considered a micro-influencer because she has 10,000 followers. <laughs> and she had um, my favourite thing that happened with Farley, because they get recognised now, and so because I use their real names. And um, they just, they're just big old hams. They just love it. For a girl, uh, Farley was out with her boyfriend one night and she um, went to the loo and came back and this very drunk girl was chewing the ear off her boyfriend. And Farley said, oh, what's going on? And she was in floods of tears. And she was like, my best friend's just got engaged and I feel like I'm losing her as a friend and I don't know what to do. And Farley said, have you read a book called Everything I Know About Love? 
which is essentially the kind of plot of our, of our friendship and the memoir. And she said, yes. And Farley said, I'm Farley. Oh and she went, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> and Farley went, no, I'm the real Farley. <laughs> and she went, that's what my friends say about me. And then a boyfriend was like, no, this is a picture. It's the real one from real life. <laughs> brilliant. So that was kind of the trippiest thing that I think has happened to them. Yeah, well, I mentioned you murdered the memoirist in you and you very yeah. much decided you didn't want to write about your own personal life. So tell us a bit about that process. Um, and then I want to talk to you about ghosts and how you disappeared off to the middle of nowhere to write that book. Yeah, it's a yeah. Story. But was um, it, in a, it was very intentional for you to start to draw a line under that. Yes, I, it was a, after the paperback came out, I just very, very suddenly decided I couldn't do it anymore. Mm. And I've been doing it for a long time. You know, I was writing pathetic little blogs from the age of 15 that was basically Dear Diary on <laughs> blogspot.com. Um, I was writing, like, dating columns and sex columns all through my early 20s. I was writing that dating column for the Sunday Times. I then wrote a memoir about my whole life. And it was just a number of things. I just... My audience suddenly was much bigger by the time the book came out. And writing about the ins and outs of your life and your family life and your love life and even your life with your friends in, it, in, in very specific detail and posting about them, all that stuff. I just, it was so much scarier having hundreds of thousands seeing, of people seeing that rather than 300 people. Um, and I just learned that I wasn't built for it. Like, I can't have my decisions in life picked apart and analysed by hundreds of thousands of people I don't know and, and mm. kind of judge. I wish I was one of those just dames that just <laughs> didn't give a fuck. Um, and I, I'm just not. And I, I wish I was. And I'm so lucky that we've got those women who say, I don't care about what people think about me. It's useful for me to share my experiences mm. as being a woman to help us, you know, in that very confessional way to help connect us. Mm. And we need those, we need those writers and what they do is so brave. I just don't have the the thick enough skin for it. Mm. So what I decided to do was basically continue writing about everything that's happening in my life, mm. but cloaking it in layer upon layer upon layer of fiction and retrospect, and then adding in, you know, something that is surprisingly much more interesting than my life, which is other people's lives. <laughs> um, and, you know, inventing characters and researching characters and researching stories, and I much prefer that process of amalgamation. Mm. And so tell us about disappearing off um, to write Ghosts. It's yeah. wonderful, by the way. I absolutely loved it. Um, Thank you. Tell, why did you have to disappear to finish it? Why did you get this real urge to be on your own? And Yes. I mean, I'm quite an extreme person. I remember when... <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you know that <laughs> I about did, me, I did Roisin. notice that. Yeah. Um, when I was doing my dissertation, I remember I sort of just went underground into the bunker of my room and only ate Alpen cereal. <laughs> And sort of. God, I, do you remember Alpen? I know. Does anyone eat Alpen anymore? <laughs> I mean, I've got, you've just got to refresh Every, back I know. with the taste of it. I Everything like the I know I about Alpen. <laughs> yeah, and it was lovely and sugary. Yeah, it was lovely oh, Alpen. They, might, the they might have that up in the big house. Yeah, well. I'm blaming something for the Brexit. Um, <laughs> that's why Alpen's disappeared. But I, I'm very like I like. I, I like the passionate love affair that comes with the deadline. <laughs> I like locking myself away um, with the, with the thing, not humans, um, <laughs> with the with the project. And I like um, just kind of getting completely immersed in it. So that I I basically I went to Devon to go li live in this kind of cottage by the sea in the middle of nowhere. I don't drive because I'm completely useless. <laughs> and um, uh, the nearest shop was like an hour and a half walk away. And um, I went there for two weeks to finish the novel. And then after week one, Boris Johnson announced lockdown. So I stayed there for three months. Three months. And tell everyone how long you had to walk to go to get some shopping. Hour and a half. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, Claire, her agent, said that time. She was very thin when she came. I was. <laughs> I was. I was looking great on it. Um, but it was, it was a really extreme experience. It was like the most solitude I've ever experienced in my life during that time when everyone was experiencing solitude, when the whole world was disconnected. Um, and I don't... Yeah, it was like a big test of, of my own resilience. I mean, yeah, I drank a lot of Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> 
That's so, what I learned about myself. <laughs> <laughs> and you had a lovely tan when you came back. And I had a very nice tan. Yeah. And you had a book. I love that. Some people find themselves in three months of <laughs> solitude. <laughs> I got a good tan and an alcohol problem. <laughs> and, and so I want to go back to the TV series as well, because it's really interesting. I think people are interested in how it works. You had written... 40,000 words of everything I know about love. Yes. And then what happened? Because the TV rights were actually sold quite early on. And it's, it's interesting how those kind of things work. Yeah. So basically, the um, Bridget Jones's diary was made by a man called Eric Fellner, who runs a production company called Working Title. And Bridget Jones's diary actually began as columns in the evening standard, yeah, I, I think. think it was the by, standard. Yeah, by Helen Fielding. And Eric liked those columns and then when he found out that it was being turned into a book he bought the book kind of immediately at, and then they started working on the film straight after so he used to read my dating column um and reluctantly i concede that there may have been parallels <laughs> between me and bridget jones and um <laughs> he decided to try and do the same with those columns so when he heard that that, that the book was out for submission before before penguin had bought it working title had bought it so but then I sort of had to forget that because I, I never thought that, that the book would end up being on screen and I still had half a book to write so I couldn't sit there mm. thinking Dolly 24 with a glint in her eye and a Marlboro <laughs> light in her hand sachets down Camden High Street um, I had to kind of completely separate that because I didn't want to write it in a self-conscious way and then when you went to do the TV series with that again but going back to the fictionalised you I think you went and you wanted it to be much more diverse because it does end up even how people look how I imagine them in the book yeah. it's very different yes and that was important to you to make very, it very yeah because I, again going back to to what you know, the, the restrictions of memoir is that you can only write about your own life if you're writing authentically. Mm. And my life had been very suburban. Um, it had been very white and it had been very middle class. Now, I don't think like, you know, I can't be intersectional when writing about that story. Um, but you know, I absolutely can when I'm putting it on screen and I absolutely can when I'm making it a, a semi-fictional story. And we wanted it to be like London in 2012. So that meant having people from lots of different backgrounds moving to the city. Um, and then also, like, beyond the need for representation on screen, which is obviously very important, um, it also, as a screenwriter, it's just much more interesting to have people from different backgrounds and different heritage, heritages and, you know, with just different kinds of stories. It's just you don't want four girls all from the same place with the same background. Yeah. And it has a had absolutely rave reviews. I mean, it must be so satisfying because that's always the worry when anything comes out, what people are going to think. I know. And uniformly across the board, like people are just raving about the I show. I know, I'm did, so Did relieved. you sit and... Were you, yes. What did you do on the night when it was... Oh, out? on the night. I yeah. thought you meant did you sit just clicking refresh oh, yeah, on Google <laughs> waiting for the reviews to come in. The night before the reviews came in, I had a sleepless night and I had a very vivid nightmare that um, The Guardian gave us naught stars, <laughs> which broke history. <laughs> and the Queen mentioned it in her Jubilee speech. <laughs> which I think says a lot about my psyche, that even when I'm being disastrous, I'm like, well, I'm still important enough for the Queen to talk about what a disaster I am. Um, so, yeah, no, that was, that was just a massive, massive relief. But to be totally honest, like something that I've learned with the process with TV is um, reviews are lovely and that's nice and it's always just very embarrassing when you have a bad review. Like, that's the thing that I think is the overwhelming... You just feel very embarrassed about your peers seeing it. So it's nice to have people say, we enjoy this work, but that's mainly for your industry. Yeah. You know, the, the girls that I love, like my girls, um, that, like, read my books and watch my shows, like, they're not refreshing all the paper websites uh, on Monday. They just want to watch the show and then they want to enjoy it. They want to watch it with their friends, talk about it with their friends. They want to share, share, about, share it on social media. So actually the real kick this week has been that rather than yeah. the reviews. And that's really the thing that matters. And have you sort of been listening on conversations or have friends been telling you what they've heard people saying? Is that kind of been feeding back? Yeah, I mean, I've had, I went out the day after it aired, I went out and I got completely mobbed by a group of girls, um, <laughs> which I just loved. I just love, I'm just really, really lucky um, with my readership. I've just got like the nicest, nicest women and I always like meeting them and they always spill their guts out to me and I lap it up. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, you know, she likes being mobbed. Just to take a <laughs> and just want to remind everyone that the basket of Dolly is going around. So raise your hand if you have a question. She basically, she's like a kind of psychic, counsellor, therapist. <laughs> she's everything. You know everything, right? I hope everyone is, is noting that this is laced with heavy irony. <laughs> No, she's going to fix your life. Um, and so what next then? Because you're on this road, you're on this trajectory. You're very, um, you work very hard, I think, at what you do and you, you, at your craft. Um, do you have big dreams and ambitions about what else you want to do? Are you kind of full? Are you fizzing with stuff? Yeah, I don't get um, loads and loads of ideas. I'm not one of those writers that has like a million ideas. I think that I get an idea... And then I become very, like, one idea and I become very obsessed with it. Uh, Although that being said, last night I'm going to write a novel next. um, And last night (laughs) I bared my soul to Rosheen, my agent and friend Claire, and Booker Prize winner DBC Pierre, and said, can I tell you what I think the title is going to be? Are you ready? And I told them and they all went, oh, no, that's not good. (laughs) And if DBC Pierre doesn't think the title of your novel is good, I think probably you have to change it. <laughs> do you want to tell everyone what it is? No, I do not. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm writing a novel next. And then um, I would really, really want to write series two of the show. Um, I would love to write more comedy drama about, um, you know, relationships and family and friends. Um, and I'd love to write a historical adaptation. I really want to write a big um, rom-com, a big rom-com about men and women that isn't um, completely miserable because every story I've written about men and women so far has been quite miserable. So I'd like to write something hopeful about heterosexuality. Excellent. That sounds Some brilliant. Task, yeah. Are you, like, would you say you're ambitious, Dolly? Like, from an early age, do you think you were? Do you think you, you wanted your name in lights? You wanted to achieve this kind of thing? I think I've always been very career obsessed. And I do kind of, I do, um, I, I'm not sure if it's like, I don't know. Ambitious, I think, bestows it with too much virtue. I think, it, <laughs> I think I've just always been really, well, I mean, writing is just how I kind of process the world and that's how I've been since I was five years old when I was writing you know diaries or whatever and that is just I I don't understand uh, the alternate life like I I still keep a diary now I don't understand the that's going to be my retirement fund uh publishing (laughs) those (laughs) um I still I don't understand how you can how this life living it alone would be enough for me I have to just like try and work it all out on the page afterwards um but I don't think I don't think I'm like wildly ambitious I think I've just always had had this thing about career and I do often imagine another life and another iteration where like I think it's really brilliant to not be obsessed with your career and I think I often meet people and lots of my friends are people who their home life and their life with their family and their life in nature and their life in kind of exploration of the world is the thing that's most important to them and the the way you know the job facilitates that and I think that that I I don't like career fetishism you know I've actually the dear Dolly um letter this week is from a girl who is asking me whether she should like go take this dream job and then leave her boyfriend behind and I'm really careful that like I don't want to like I know what I would do but everyone's different and I just think like you can a, a really fulfilling life is often one that is is very untouched by career actually as someone that you admire and you talk about a lot is Nora Ephron, and she seems to be like a bit of a touchstone in in terms of someone who you admire and what she does and what, what her output. Tell us why she her work resonate, resonates so much with you. Do you know what she has, which is something that I'm always trying to do, and I still don't think I do it well, but this is the like process for me the rest of my life as a writer, <laughs> trying to work out how to do it. She manages to balance sincerity and cynicism, mm-hmm. and I think cynicism is 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 sort of the easiest thing to do as a writer it's very popular and it's um it's it's easy to be suspicious and it's easy to be mocking um and I think true sincerity and open-heartedness and you know like feeling not being terrified by the um threat of cliche not being you know which is the thing that writers live most in fear of is unoriginality and the problem is is that in every cliche lies the greatest truths like that's why everyone says them all the time Mm. so it's like how do you like I think it is very brave as a writer to explore 
matters of the heart and the truths of life that have been explored a million times before, actually. Yeah. So, like, I that that is the balance that Nora Ephron did so well, that she would deliver these amazing, biting observations about men and women and family and dating and, you know, politics. But she also had this great, great, deep belief in love and the simple joys of life and the pleasures of life. And she articulated both equally well. And that is an unbelievable skill to have. Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about vulnerability because you mentioned it earlier and about... I, there's a really great book that's out very soon called Notes on Heartbreak by Annie Lord. Um, it's basically... Fabulous. It's really, really wonderful. Um, but I was thinking... I was interviewing her and thinking about how she's very young. She's sort of around the age you were when your memoir came out. Yeah. And, you know, but I'm sort of feeling like what will she be opened up to? What kind of criticisms? Again, just what you spoke to, the online world... It's, um, I, I feel like kind of writing is really important and powerful and um, I, I hate when it's sneered at or people mm. denigrate it, make it out that it's not important, that's trivial. I yeah. think young women speaking about the truth of their lives is massively important, but it also comes with a lot of people being horrible about it. And I'm just wondering what you think about that. Has that got worse? And is it like, you know, if you think back to when everything I know about love first came out, like, would it be different now? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think I'm glad that I wrote it when I did. I think I wasn't hip to the cynicism of the internet when I wrote it. And I'm really glad I wasn't because I think that it's quite an embarrassingly earnest book, mm. actually. Yeah. Everything I know about love, it <laughs> cringes me out reading. Occasionally I have to do readings from it. Uh, but otherwise I really do stay as far away from it as possible <laughs> because it is, it is very earnest and it is very open-hearted. And I think, yeah, if I, if, if I was aware of how of how mean the internet can be, I think that I probably wouldn't have written it. And I agree with you. I mean, the thing that, like, it's the feminist drum that I bang all the time, and I'm sure everyone's bored of me hearing, of me talking about it, but I just think we have to constantly, when we're bashing something that's created by a woman mm. or that, like, millions and millions and millions of women love, if, if there is also this, like, alternate commentary that it's stupid or silly or embarrassing or there's you know so in my case the thing that I get a lot of flack for that like I'm very very sensitive about how people receive my work and I know the responsibility of my platform and I really really do get very anxious about communicating the right things there is one thing that I feel absolutely no shame about and it's showing female hedonism I don't care if people have an issue with that and people do have issues with it and it doesn't matter to me because male flaneurism and male hedonism has been so celebrated <laughs> in literature over years and years and years and years and when we have women do it it's suddenly this like cautionary tale or it's like loaded with judgment and shame and I'm just not having any of it so like throw all that at me I don't mind so I think it's just like making sure that when there are these things that we're saying about things that women love that we're not just re reverting to a really retrograde stance which is basically women's interests are stupid and if loads of women like something, then it's trivial. Mm. So I just think we have to be like super aware of that when, whenever there's kind of mass pylons to mm. populist women's stuff. Because has there been some criticism about the drug taking, for example, in everything I know about love? Yes. The CV series? Something that's so interesting to me is uh, people are writing about episode, about the series overall, as it, of it being a drugs binge. Mm -hmm. And it's like a cocaine fueled binge. There is one scene that lasts less than a minute where the characters experiment with drugs in a very light-hearted way like so many 24 year olds do before they realize that guinness is much more fun <laughs> it is well you certainly think it is anyway <laughs> you love your guinness you love your guinness. so i'm I gonna i'm gonna guinness. go to our basket of dolly yes if that's okay do you feel who am i to be telling these people how to live their lives or do you actually like think yes i know the no answers. i think i have every right to tell them how to live their lives because i screw mine up so readily okay. i think that's why i think the key to being a good agony aunt it's not being an expert or being full of wisdom. I think it's being willing to reflect on all the many, many, many times that you have made the same mistakes. Right. I think that's the only thing that's needed to be an agony aunt. I do, and I often will point out in the column, I will say, this is, I'm going to give you advice now that I don't follow, but... <laughs> 
on my highest my highest Excellent. self knows that's what she should be doing <laughs> okay i'm gonna i'm gonna do this also after these questions if you have any questions for dolly yourself that aren't related to your life um tragedy and trauma then <laughs> feel free we'll, we'll have a come to them as well okay i'm gonna come to the first one okay what should one do with members of one's family who believe in conspiracy theories like anti-vax, uh, Trump won the election and refuse to join us on planet Earth, which they think is flat? <laughs> <laughs> I added that. <laughs> this is one of the most common really? questions that I okay. get from, um, from the inbox for Dear Dolly. So here's the thing that I think, when I interviewed Graham Norton, he was an agony uncle for years. And he said to me, he thinks the role of an agony aunt or uncle is to imagine and empathise with the person that the writer is rightfully complaining about. So you can view the problem 360. So I know, like, whenever I get questions like that, and I have family members who have, like, wildly differing political <laughs> values to me, and I find it very upsetting and I get very emotional about it what I now understand is if someone is leaning into an extreme ideology like anti-vaxxing or flat earthing um, <laughs> the likelihood is that they are not being heard for some reason that they feel like they are being dismissed they feel disenfranchised they feel patronized they feel spoken down to and the the fur like the further radicalized they get the less is is a product of the less they feel they are being he held and listened to so actually the best thing and if this is so hard to do but the best thing i think to start with is to like invite a conversation where you say to that person like can you tell me why you have come to this conclusion so i know an anti vaxxer very well who i know and love and i had decided to just be like chill with her and just mm. ask her about what it is and actually how it transpired is she had been massively 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 neglected and basically abused by our health service like in the past she'd had she'd had things happen to her which meant she felt like she couldn't trust yeah. doctors and medical professionals and I think that is kind of the first step with being able to then enter a conversation of like sharing your own views and like helping to like educate for want of a better word but I think if it comes with a from a place of attack you're just not going to get anywhere Okay, very good. She's good, isn't she? <laughs> uh, no wonder they pay you all that money. <laughs> the um, oh, this is a good one. Is there an end in sight to online dating? I want to get back dating, but I can't stand the apps. P.S. We love you and we'll stalk you here for a glass of wine. Yes, thank Excellent. you. Excellent. I mean, I don't know. I'm just like, I'm 50. I just, I don't mind saying it, you know, a lot older <laughs> than Dolly. I'm not ashamed of it, you know, embracing my age, but I don't know. How, I would I don't think I would have been able for that. Like, I I know that sounds very old, me to say that, but I just find it, I feel so sorry for everybody, but I know I shouldn't because that's just the way it is. Yeah. It just it seems awful to also, me. Also, the way that Roisin met her partner was so cool. And I don't know if other millennials have this, but you know when you meet couples and you're like, how do you meet? And they're like, oh, we, um, we sat next to each other on a plane and um, I got his mushroom stroganoff and he got my chicken pie. And we just started talking. I'm like, ha, 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 lucky you. It's like, I'm so annoyed about it. I'm like, those romantic encounters just don't exist. Roisin, tell everyone how oh, you met yeah, your partner. I met my partner in the middle of a riot it was love at first riot how we were in cool yeah we were in the that? north i was supposed to be covering uh you know the garvahi road situation with the irish times but i wasn't i was fancying some guy and then <laughs> i got his number on a pretense and then 22 years later and two 13 year olds yes, yeah there we are and what a great story see, that, that wouldn't have happened to... on the apps i'll tell you that no <laughs> no and you get to hold that forever i love that you know every couple likes to create its own mythology yeah. you know how they began and what that story is and i think there is something so deeply unromantic about saying i was lying on my sofa <laughs> watching coronation street <laughs> eating delivery and a 2d version of his face came up <laughs> That's how dad and, his and I face met. If you're lucky. If you're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> I believe not having been so on So she hears. <laughs> um, so is it is it the way of life forever? Is that it? Okay, here's people. a way of thinking about okay. it because I've been so doomy about dating apps before. And actually, dating app, the first like trace of a dating app was in a Victorian newspaper called The Roundabout, where people would write in and they would advertise for, and they would do, you know, what you write on dating websites now when you say like, 
Spurs fan loves pizza, <laughs> sun chaser, whatever. The Victorian people would have said, like, love my penny farthing. I don't know. Like, that's, that's, the only, that's the only Victorian reference I have. So this idea of there being, like, a third party that matches yeah, you so an old is one. historic. Yeah. Mm. And that might be your parents. Yeah. That might be the church. That might be a newspaper. It might be a matchmaker. So it's just now... A digital one. It's okay. a digital third party. So I think to try and like, you can date not on dating apps. It is harder. Um, the, a good thing that to do, but it depends how much shame you have. I have very little. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> is that uh, you can write an email oh. to basically everyone you know and say, "Do you have someone you want to set me up with?" Right. And I, I do idea. think like, particularly have you, you ever get, done that? Yes. Have you? Yeah. Oh. And the other key is here's the key. <laughs> the friends' boyfriends. So you've got to chummy up to them. You've got to let them go on about their DIY they're doing. You've got to ask them questions about their rugby team. And then say to them, do you have any friends? Because they're an untapped resource. Okay. Because your closest friends, basically... Like a lot of hard work. It is a lot of hard okay. work, Roisin. We can't so all just go look sexy at a riot. <laughs> I really want to look sexy. <laughs> I just railroaded him into it. He had no choice. So it was one of those. Um, but I think that's like the friend set up. That's, that's a good route. But otherwise, yeah. if you want to do dating apps and give it a good go, I think just think of it as like this very old romantic thing, okay. which is someone helping bring people together. And you know what? Like year on year, the percentage of weddings that have happened off the back of a dating app just increases to the point where last year I think it was over 50%. And that can only be a great romantic thing. So I think you just have to think about it. Mean, I'm thinking when people see your face pop up on a dating app, they must be like, oh, not her. She's going to write about me. They constantly... I'm not on dating apps anymore, but they constantly... I'd, I'd match with someone. They'd obviously Google me, and I'd just get, not for me, lol, and then an unmatch. This is an interesting one now, um, and I think we should rattle through, because I'd like to get to as many uh, of yeah. them as possible. Uh, to accept the impact the mothering my mother had on me, and I, that's, that's how it's written, but I think it's about... Um, coming to terms with maybe less positive ways that someone was mothered or the way they were brought up mm. and, and how to move on from that. Do you get questions about people's relationship with their parents? Constantly, and... yeah. I mean, our, our parents are the context of how we enter the world. They, they're how we learn about love. Um, I was in Freudian therapy for a while and we obviously all we did was just talk about my mum and dad every single week. She was um, a very hilarious Australian woman and her thing that she said constantly was, got to unchain yourself from the womb. Unchain ah. yourself from the womb. That's really, that's a good Australian accent. Thank she you. Did a bit of acting as well. She did a lot of shouting. I'm, I'm just going to give you this one as well because it's okay, sort of related. How do you manage uh, sometimes overbearing pressures from mothers? Again, look at me yeah. down on mothers. Jeez. Um, about romantic relationships relationships and the pressure to have kids yeah god i've had to have this conversation with my mum um so <laughs> first of all with the mum's thing um if you if that first question is in relation to an unhappy childhood first of all i'm i'm so sorry if that that was the reality for you um I was very fortunate in that I, I didn't have that experience growing up. Mm. I have lots of friends who are estranged from parents or who have childhood that they don't like to reflect on. And I think the way they've always told me they dealt with it is that you don't have to accept this very traditional idea of a family life and your home base being the people who raised you. So it's like your family life can be the family that you create with someone that you love. It can be the family that you make with your friendships. It can be the family that you make with your creative collaborators and the people that you work with. And I think that, that that's actually much more common than that. That's nothing to feel ashamed of. That's no failure of a life. Um, in terms of overbearing mothers, this is something I get all the time from uh, people writing in. I think the best way with the phone situation is to have a, a schedule. So you say, mum, if she wants to talk every day, you say, can we talk from and have a really specific thing that makes you get off the phone? So a good one is walking from the house to a bus okay. or to a train <laughs> so she knows that she gets exactly seven minutes. And I think that basically in the same way you have to give boundaries for children, sometimes you have to give them for your own parents. And I'm just thinking, my sister rings my mum every day when she's going to get her sandwich for work. Is that there we go, doing? because she knows it's, it's an allotted amount of time. So that's my top tip. 
Okay, this is a good one as well. Uh, someone from in their mid to late 20s, I've never had a relationship and I'm afraid of sex and intim intimacy, but outwardly confident, have you any tips? And by the way, someone also wants to know your star sign. So we can add that as well. But this is someone who hasn't had a relationship and is a bit afraid of, of uh, starting this. Yeah. All of that. Okay, so uh, first of all, Virgo sun, Gemini <laughs> rising, Taurus moon. Um, um, what are you, Oshin? Libra. <laughs> that explains it. Um, <laughs> no, I say that about everyone. Uh, Libra is so great. <laughs> Libra is great. Um, so I think, first of all, what's important to remember is it's very, very normal to go through your whole 20s without a relationship. Like, extremely normal. And I know that it feels not normal. And I have... I, I basically didn't... I had very few relationships in my 20s. I had friends who had no relationships at all. And they felt very, very ashamed about it. It was like something was wrong with them. And I wish that people talked more about how kind of normal that is. Um, I mean, I personally think it's normal to not have a relationship your whole life, to be totally honest, if that's what right, is right for you. I think that, you know, it's not right for everyone. Um, and also, like, you've got to meet the right person. So don't be too tough on yourself about that and know that it's very normal. And then the other thing that I would say is looking for a, the right partner or looking for any sort of, like, just loving partner. I know how scary that can feel and, like, you might not know what to do um, in, like, you know, ro romance and intimacy... But I think it's like when you're desperate for a job, when you're looking for a job, that it's like all you can think about and then like you kind of dream about it and every time you meet someone who has a job, you're like, how did they get their job? Mm. And it's like absolutely obsessed you and you're like, when I get a job, I'm going to be so thankful every day that I get to get up and go to work. And then you get a job and then immediately you're like, oh, this fucking job. <laughs> so I basically think that basically it, when you meet the right person, it's suddenly, it's so easy and you don't think about that longing and all that time anymore. Yeah. It just becomes a part of your life and that will happen to you. There's one uh, somebody had mentioned to me earlier about being a younger woman in a relationship with an older man and wondering about that and how, what you think of that and it feels very into that relationship but, you know, wonders what other people will think. I'm very pro age gap relationships. <laughs> I think that people's souls age at totally different times. I think that, yes, like, he might die before you do, but, you know, like... <laughs> I don't really accept that as a valid thing because I'm like, yeah, but young men die and young men cheat and, you know, it's just like so many ways that relationships could end anyway. And I think that in this life, it is so rare to have a soul connection with someone. If your soul and um, hopefully a body is crying out to him <laughs> and saying, you are someone I like hanging out with and I really like your brain and I want to spend more time with you and you treat me well and I want to have a story with you, it doesn't... I just wouldn't take just you have to grab that in life it's rare okay uh, my best friend's wife is doing a lot of emotional bargaining to him and I don't know how to tell my friend that's not okay um I mean I think any sort of the bargaining is never good in any relationship when you're kind of totting up points with each other I think that's look you definitely I think there are phases of life when you definitely do that I think when there's like lots of housework or lots of children <laughs> that's hard not to do that I've seen with couples um but in terms of your friend going through that my my main headline rule is don't get involved in your friend's relationships oh, unless yeah. they're in danger and that sounds like an annoyance rather than a fatal danger Okay, I'm going to come to some questions for Dolly, but just one more here. This uh, person says, how do I centre myself again after spending years focused on work? That's such a good question. Um, I think the thing that, I think that like that sense of recentering yourself can feel very daunting. I find the whole industry and concept of self-love to be a very unappealing thing. <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't want to write letters <laughs> well, to Well, if you can't love yourself, how are you going to love anybody else, Dolly? Yeah, no, I agree with that. But you know that whole industry, I've got a friend who's addicted to it, of the whole, like, manifesting things and sending off wishes in a bottle and <laughs> doing meditation for every morning. That's amazing, but it's just, I can't, it just overwhelms me, that, that level of centeredness. <laughs> um, so I think what is, for me, whenever I'm feeling disconnected from myself, I just have to think about the really simple things that make me happiest when no one else is there. That's not about achievement. That's not about any sort of um, 
uh, identity signaling. Mm. Um, so for me, that is cooking, playing guitar. Let me tell you, that's definitely not about achievement. Guys, um, you need to get Dolly to sing. She has the most beautiful voice. Not now, because I know she won't do it. I'm not putting you under pressure. But I, I mean, honestly, she, you are such a beautiful singer as well. You've only heard me sing when we're both very drunk. <laughs> that's very <laughs> nice of you. Thanks, babe. Go on. Um, uh, and like spending time with friends and going on very long walks listening to music like that it's really simple that's the stuff that kind of gets me back to myself so I think just like really be honest with yourself about what are the things that when you're on your own with no one else to bear witness what are the things that make you feel most at peace yeah uh, I just read this really lovely book you've probably read it called Wintering by Catherine oh, May I haven't read it it's but it's really it's good amazing. I'd really recommend it to everyone it's, has anyone heard of it yeah it's amazing I love the concept it, yeah concept. it's this idea that when um, um, really when we go through those really difficult times like I, I, when I read it I thought about my marriage when my marriage broke up I remember that very isolating time of um, just feeling like you know you're watching the world through, through glass I didn't want to tell anyone what had happened and anyway you, you, you're you're just not at your best and you can't really engage in the world in the way you normally would you feel small or you feel low and these things manifest in various different ways in our lives and this concept of wintering is that allowing that to be it almost just naming it wintering means this is a time when I have to do all the things that Dolly yeah. just said I have to find out how to nurture myself and and not be ashamed of it because I think when we're in those really bad times in our lives you can feel a lot of guilt and shame like I should be able to just rally and I should be able to yes. go out in the world but this book is all about how no it makes sense everyone has a fallow period she says and totally. and that's when you kind of enrich yourself and give back to yourself whether it's books or guitar or long walks or or drinking pints of guinness or that kind of thing i um, love that but it's a really wonderful book that i'd recommend um everyone to read who is on the, and, and someone nodding here with the lovely lipstick and uh, shirt as well <laughs> so i'm gonna open it up to questions because i know that you all have a lot of questions and uh, not necessarily advice but just or you can ask us some more advice but just for dolly and we're so pleased to have you here dolly was supposed to come two years ago um yeah should we should we say three what happened? years ago I put my passport in the recycling. Okay. Um, <laughs> and they will not let me forget. Every person keeps coming up to me. Well, you were meant to be here a few years ago. Apparently you lost your passport. And I'll say, yeah, put it in recycling. <laughs> there's, a co- there's a couple of people here who've been here since uh, two years ago waiting. They told <laughs> They've been me. waiting in this tent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So anybody got any questions for Dolly before we, we finish? Oh, there's a gentleman. Oh, is it DBC Pierre? It's DBC Pierre. <laughs> All right. Booker <laughs> Prize winner. This is the quality of the event we have here today. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dolly. A serious question. Um, since the sexual revolution... Yes. The notion of slow love, the notion of uh, that love which is duty and companionship and all that kind of... The non-chemistry stuff, the non-sexy stuff... Mm. It's still there behind the idea that after our chemistry does its work, we'll end up in a place where there's that kind of love. And indeed, across the world, take India, Pakistan, where a lot of people are in arranged marriages. And if you meet the older ones, they'll swear to you that although they never met their partner, love does grow among them. Is there still a space for that? Do you feel that the pressure is now all on the sexy end of it? And that, in fact, no one's thinking about that is just a nice person. And I, you know, my pulse hasn't been banging, but actually I'm very comfortable next to them. We're not yeah. looking at the, at the slow game anymore. I think it's such a good point. And, you know, it's one of the things, having said I won't be too doomy about dating apps, it's something that a, a lot of my single friends in their 30s say, is that they will go on a date with a man and they will have a nice time and they'll get on well and they'll stay for hours talking and they might not kiss or they might not talk about a second date, but it feels like there is a, you know, a, a sense of mutual respect and fondness for each other. And almost constantly the thing that happens to them is they get a message from the bloke the next day saying there wasn't a spark. And I remember my friend saying like, well, do you know what, Derek, there wasn't a spark for me, but like, <laughs> guess what? <laughs> Love's really hard and let's see if there's a space where this can grow. Like you don't necessarily need to have this like hormonal you know, Vesuvius feeling when you're, like, in a Pizza Express with a stranger. Like, there's... <laughs> Not Pizza Express, I just think of Prince Andrew. <laughs> oh, no. No. I'm sorry to put that all in your heads. Um, uh, 
Uh, but I agree with you, that sense of, you know, a slow burn and a, and a slow... I, I don't know what's caused it. The sexual revolution, I think, obviously, is, is, a, is a persuasive argument. I think that it is the, like, hypersexual culture. I think it is great for some people, but I think it can make other people feel quite marginalised. I think that for a lot of people, then they're, they're not prioritising sex and thinking about sex that much. And sexuality isn't such a huge part of their identity. Um, the thing that I... Uh, something that I heard, which is one of those clichéd sayings, but I think about all the time, um, and that I say to people is th th that you should put more friendship into your romance and more romance into your friendship. Mm -hmm. And I basically, as I get older, I'm just like... So, uh, in fact, the Dear Dolly tomorrow is about this very thing. It was about a girl who had one of those relationships that made you, like, ill with love. <laughs> she was so obsessed with him, like, she was lovesick. Then after she broke up with him, she's now just got this lovely fella who's, like, a best friend, and they, they, the love is growing, and that it doesn't feel like that's how love should be. And something that I said to her is, like, you know, if you start from that place, which has to be facade but if you don't know each other you can't feel that intensely about each other in a, in a kind of spiritual level um if you start there there's only one way you go and it's it diminishes whereas wouldn't you prefer to start somewhere quieter and for love to grow in a slower way and the foundations that it's built on is about you know going through experiences together and meeting each other's family and learning about each other. And, you know, that's the kind of love that appeals to me these days. Thank you very much, Pierre, Thank for that you. question. Very nice. Does anyone else have a question for Dolly before we wrap up? OK, person down there. The, all the people speaking so far have been men. That's so interesting. Go on, anyway. Hi, Dolly. Thank you. Um, really interesting talk. Um, I travel a lot. And does that mean that I'm doomed to be celibate until I settle down? Or is it possible to do... <laughs> long-distance relationships because it just doesn't work for me but yeah I don't know whether am I emotionally available I don't know <laughs> I feel like maybe you might need to do a one-on-one -on -one -on -one session there, yeah. <laughs> I think I am I she's think I yeah am. she's doing a one-on-one -on -one. I think I am <laughs> Give us answer, Jerome. can I ask what your name is Joe you look a lot like a man who once took me on the worst date of my life <laughs> He was a very handsome man, but he took me on Camden's rock and roll. It was four years ago. He took me on Camden's rock and roll walking history tour. Um, very you. OK. Maybe it was him. Um, I, is he emotionally available? He thinks he is. Um, I would say that, you know, if you're prioritising travel, which you definitely should do if that's something that you're able to do and you're lucky enough to do, like, that's so cool. Um, if that's what you're prioritising, I mean, I, this is proper cod psychology here. I really don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I would say you're probably not prioritising finding a partner and laying down roots. And I think that, I think maybe you, you feel like you should be doing that and that's what's causing this schism. But actually, like, if you want to just go be free and not meet lots of people and not have to get into, like, the logistics of long-distance relationships, which sounds like something you don't want to do, like... Take the burden off, like just just prioritize that further down the line. Um, you know, the good thing is you're a man, so you have the privilege of uh. if you want to have kids in 50 years, my friend, you can. Um, <laughs> um, I was going to ask, is the podcast coming back? I mean, it was such a huge, huge success. Will that ever happen again, or was that just a once? Off? No, the high low won't come back, but I would love to do an interview podcast um, in the future. But writing's kind of preoccupying me at the moment, but I would love to interview again. Okay, I think we've time for a couple more. If anyone else has, uh, maybe a woman, because there, we, we've heard a lot and very, very good for. <laughs> Yeah, are there any women in here? <laughs> she can't see it. Um, so, Dolly, I wanted to ask you, what, so I have binged all of the series of Everything I Know But Love. Oh, so, thank you. And uh, so I thoroughly enjoyed the book and I thoroughly enjoyed the series. I found both quite different. So particularly the last episode really struck me and I have been thinking about it since I watched it. Yeah. Um, so I suppose two questions. So one is, I did wonder as I was watching it, whether a particular episode that happens in that, or a particular moment in that episode was inspired by your 2019 Boris experience. Um, I don't know if you kind of, let's say, would we'll, we'll trade that one. But separately, I guess, it really gave me a flavour that you might be interested in maybe feature film writing or rom-com writing, and I just wondered if you could talk about that. Um, 
Okay, so I... It, will people be cross if I talk about spoilers? Yes, okay. So something about the end episode, which I'm not going to... Talk, I'll talk about in vagaries, is... Uh, so there are seven episodes in the series, which is kind of quite a strange number. To be totally honest, COVID took an episode <laughs> away from us in terms of funding um, because it, take, it costs so much money to make stuff in COVID. Um, I, when we first, when I first watched it with the cast of girls, we got to the end of episode seven and Belle Powley, who plays Birdie, turned around <laughs> to me with huge eyes and said, where's episode eight? <laughs> and I was like, that's it, honey, I'm afraid. That's the end. And she was like, that can't be the end. And I've had lots of messages from people saying that because all I will say is that it's an open-ended ending. And I would love to say that that was an artistic choice. It was. It is also, it makes it much more likely I'll get commissioned for series yes. two. Okay. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up. So yeah. season two is on the cards, hopefully. 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 Eric Fellner, working title there. Yes, They I loved it. So. And they're happy with you. Yeah. I hope and so. Go back. Well, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure. I want to thank you all. What a lovely all for audience. Asking thank so you. many questions. And Dolly Alderton. Yeah.